So in, in chapter 35 here, we're picking up, of course, from last week was that whole entire story was dedicated to Dinah and the fornication that happened. And then it ended with uh, Jacob's children, with two of his sons, uh, Simeon and Levi, going in and destroying the whole, all the men out of Shechem. And, of course, Jacob's concerned now that, you know, the, the people, other people in the other, the other towns and the other villages are going to come out against them and destroy them because they did this thing, because they killed all the men of Shechem. So in chapter 35 is where we're picking up. And it says in verse number 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. So basically we see Jacob's in trouble again, right? And of course he's legitimately concerned for his safety based on what his sons had done. But God appears unto him, and he's, he's essentially telling him again, hey, I want you to go back to Bethel, and remember, Bethel's a place where I, where I appeared unto you when you were scared and running from Esau, because now he's going to be scared and running from the other people that are around him in the land. And he's saying, go back there, go back to Bethel. And what I believe this is a calling and, and kind of a, a waking up Jacob and, and a shaking him and just saying, look, you know, like, get back over here. Because what he did when he left Paden Aram, he did go into the land of Canaan, but he didn't go very far into the land of Canaan. He didn't go all the way back. I was, I was studying the geography of this. I'm not, I'm not an expert by any means on all of the geography of these places. I, I'm trying to study and learn about that more as I get time because it's extremely interesting where all these places are. The problem I have is just, you know, when you look at maps, it's still even hard to tell what to trust. Um, was that real? I don't know. But um, from, what, from what I've been able to see is that Paden Aram was up north. If you think of where Israel is now, you can think of the map right by the Mediterranean Sea. And up on the north side was where Paden Aram was. And he was coming down out of there because that's where he went and he was, he was serving Laban and, and he got his wives and he was left from there and he, and he came down a little bit. Now Esau went all the way down to Seir, which is much, much further south. Of, of like in the, in the Israel area, in the south area of it. And Jacob stopped and he, and he made a, his place in Succoth and then he went to Shechem here and, and kind of pitched his tent outside of Shechem. That's still on the northernmost part and God's calling him back down to Bethel. And you remember the reason why Jacob left Laban was one of the reasons God called him and said, hey, go back to the land of your fathers. Go back to, to the land of Abraham and Isaac. And that land where they were was much further south, where they were sojourning, where they were staying in the land of Canaan. It was much further south. Now, Jacob had got himself out of Paden Aram, but he didn't really seem to get very far. And it, and it would seem to me that that might have been part of the problem, that God was kind of telling him, you know, go back. And what happened is he lost sight of, of making it all the way down there. And then he ends up hanging around Shechem and then gets into all this trouble. His daughter gets into trouble, you know, and, and we can see that they don't seem to be too dedicated to following God. Look at verse number two. Because God calls them and said, look, go back to Bethel. Go back to where I appeared unto you. And, and you know, where you, when you fled from Esau. Verse two says, then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments. So what we see here, it's kind of like a big reset button for him. He's saying, okay, we need to get right with God. Like we need to get serious about this. We need to go back down to Bethel. And why, like I, I ask myself, why is Jacob allowing essentially his family and his servants is, is who is with him? It's not like he's got this entire city of people who, who aren't even related to him. These are his children, his servants, his handmaids. Why is he saying, now put away the strange gods? Why did he allow them to begin with? See, Jacob should have never allowed this, the, that garbage to, to creep into his family. He should have been a better leader, a better father over, over his children and over his wives and over his servants that that, that would not even be allowed. But... You know, praise the Lord, he look, he's getting right. Now he's saying, okay, look, we're going back down to Bethel. We're going back. You know, we're going to serve God. We're going to do what's right now. So, you know, maybe in your life, you've allowed sin to creep in. You've allowed some idols to come into your house. You've allowed, you know, whatever, your ever, whatever strange gods that you have 
that, that are causing you to sin, you know, these, these things that you're putting before God because you just like doing them. God's always calling us back as his children, saying, look, come back to me. And what he wants you to do is to get rid of that stuff. So he's saying, look, cast out these strange gods. Clean your clothes. Cleanse yourself. Let's clean up. Let's, you know, and obviously the, the changing your garments, it's all symbolic. He's saying, look, we need, we need to clean up our act. We need, we need to clean this sin out of our life and just, and just move back in the right direction. Because actually, when I was looking at this, I think that Shechem was even further back a little bit, like closer to Paid and Aram. So he was going the right way when he was, when he was coming out, but then it looks like when he went back to Shechem, and, and I may not be correct on this, I'm not positive on the geography, like I said, but what it looked like to me is that it went back, uh, he went back a little bit. So it's kind of like a backsliding. Now, it was definitely a spiritual backsliding because they had these strange gods. And even his wife, when they, when they left, Rachel had, had stolen Laban's, you know, one of Laban's gods. Now, he wasn't aware of it at the time, but it seems like now he's aware of these things. He's like, put away the strange gods, you know, cleanse yourself, be clean, change your garments. And um, verse number three says, and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God because that's who they should be serving anyways. We're going to make an altar unto God and we're going to serve him. We're not going to serve these false gods. He says, unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. He's serving the real God, the true Lord, the one that actually can answer prayers. He's not just some idol, some dumb idol that can't speak, some piece of wood or some piece of metal that is inanimate and can do nothing. He's actually going to serve a God who, who literally answered his prayers and, can actually, and actually has power to do things and that has kept him safe. Look at um, verse number four. It says, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. And look at this. And all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. So this is kind of interesting. And, and you know, it made me take a second look at this. Not, not recently when I was preparing for this, but before when I've seen this. You know, they're talking about getting right with God. They're talking about getting rid of all these idols. But then they add in here, and all their earrings. Well, why is that mixed in? What's, what's wrong about earrings? Like, obviously, this is not a positive connotation of earrings. It's pretty apparent because they're getting right with God. They're getting rid of strange gods, but they're also getting, getting rid of earrings. Now, flip back, if you would, just to Genesis 24. Keep your finger here in chapter 35. We'll be back to it soon enough. I'm going to explain to you why I believe that's a negative connotation and what that's referring to. But first, we're going to look at a positive connotation just, just you know, 10 chap 11 chapters earlier in Genesis, chapter 24, in verse 22, when um, Abraham had sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac, right? You remember when, when he met uh, Rebekah? In verse 22, it says, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels gold of weight. And, you know, and, he, and he puts these, these, this jewelry on Rebecca. He's giving it to her as a good thing. It's a positive thing. right? He's giving it unto Rebecca. There's another um, reference in Ezekiel chapter 16. Um, you don't have to turn or turn if you would to Judges chapter 8. Ezekiel 16. Now, in context of Ezekiel 16, he's referring to Jerusalem as a city. Now, Jerusalem, or in all cities, really, when the Bible's talking about a city, it refers to a city as, a, as like a female gender, right? A city is like a her, okay? And, and I'll show you this. I'm going to read it for you. Ezekiel 16, verse 2 says, Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. It's referring to Jerusalem as a whole, as a city, as a female gender, knowing her abominations. Okay, and that, that shouldn't come as a shock to you. I mean, this is pretty normal with, in the English language and referring to cities in, in a female context. Um, verse 3 says, And say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth in thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. Um, it's definitely a female reference. Then in verse 7 of Ezekiel 16, it says, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and it's still talking about Jerusalem, and that, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, 
and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. So uh, he's still continuing to talk about a female being the, the city of Jerusalem. And then in verse 11, it says, I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And this is, this is God speaking about Jerusalem, saying, you know, basically, I didn't read the whole thing. When he found her, you know, when Jerusalem was founded, she was, she was naked and bleed, you know, like bloody as, as a newborn baby, and no one cared about her. He said, but I cared about you. I took you in. I took care of you. And you started to grow. And then he's saying here in verse 11, you know, I decked you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hand. I was doing all these nice things for you. And verse 12 says, and I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thine head. So he mentions earrings, and again, it's a positive reference to earrings. There's nothing wrong with it. He's saying, look, I gave you this, I gave you, you, know, I gave you all these beautiful things, I put earrings in your ears. You know, we saw um, this uh, Abraham's servant giving gifts, giving bracelets, giving earrings unto Rebekah as a woman. And then in, in verse, that, you know, I don't even need to read that, it's the same thing. So that's another positive reference, but if you're in Judges chapter 8, we're going to see another um, I would consider a negative reference. And basically what I'm driving at here is that the positive references you're going to find in the Bible, there's more references to earrings, is going to be for females. I don't think there's a problem with a female wearing jewelry in general. Now the Bible says that the, uh, a woman ought to dress in modest apparel, not with all these gold and pearls you know, and everything that's going to draw attention to you and, and, just, and just be all about your looks. However, having these things for a woman to... To, to add, you know, a little bit of beauty to yourself, I don't think is a sin. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you could do so modestly. And the Bible refers to just having earrings as, as being not a bad thing in these contexts, as being a, a normal thing, a good thing for people to have that. And for, I believe, for women to have that. But look at Judges 8, verse 24. It says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. So when, you know, obviously Gideon had this great battle and he destroyed the enemy. And he says, when, you know, the, upon defeating the enemy, they, they take the spoil. They take their goods. They take the, the jewelry that's found on them, their armor, their weapons, their clothing, you know, all the things that are valuable, they're going to take from their prey. And it says here, the reason why they had taken um, earrings in a battle, in a war, it's not because they were fighting a bunch of women. It says it's because they were Ishmaelites. Now, the Ishmaelites were heathen. They were not, you know, worshiping the Lord. The Ishmaelites were, were just another heathen nation. Obviously, that stemmed from Ishmael, from the son of, of uh, Hagar, the handmaid. But they were not a godly people. And we see here that their men were wearing earrings. And, and, and it's even, you know, put in parentheses here, the reason why they even had them is because they're Ishmaelites. That's why they had them to begin with. And... I think it's, it's only natural. I've known this since a child growing up that jewelry is typically for women and not for men. I mean, I get it if a man wears a little necklace or something. I, I've never been a jewelry type of person. This is the only piece of jewelry like I ever wear. It's because I'm married. It's my ring. But um, I've always thought it was that guys were pretty, just looked like a sissy. If they, I mean, I don't even care if they were a tough guy, but they, but you, you know, they put their earring in their left ear or the right ear or whatever, whatever ear they, they did back when it was popular. You know, the one to show that they weren't a homo or whatever. They would put it in their ear, but I'm like, you look like a girl. Like, why are you putting that in your ear? I never got that. And I, and honestly, there's not a whole lot of talk about it in the Bible. This is, this is pretty much most of the evidence I'm going to show you today. Think what you want about it, but I don't think it's right for men to be, to be putting earrings in their ears. And I think this is enough evidence to show us. Now, again, it's, it's similar to the sermon I was preaching on Sunday. Is this the most important thing in your spirituality, in your spiritual life? No. But if we're going to try to be as right as possible with God, let's, let's be right. Let's, let's not try to fashion ourselves as men 
to look like a woman. Like, why do you care? First of all, as a man, why do you care so much about your looks anyways to go through the effort of piercing an ear and putting some kind of a gem or a stone or a sparkly diamond in there? Why do you care about that? That is not a manly attribute to care so much about having some sparkly diamond in your ear. It's kind of effeminate. And that is a sin, to be effeminate. Let's go back to Genesis where we were. Because as they're getting right with God, they get rid of the earrings out of their ears. And Jacob, you know, he had a lot of sons. We know he had one daughter, Dinah, but we see he had a lot of sons. And they're getting right with God and they're giving him the earrings with the false gods. So they're, they're cleaning up, they're getting cleansed, and they're purging out this stuff that, that is just, they've been backslidden with and they're getting rid of all of their junk and they're heading now the right direction again and they're heading to Bethel. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five, it says, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So here we see God is protecting them. Whereas normally the cities that were round about them might have gone and attacked them. They probably would have. But because God made a promise, because God has his protection over them, he made sure that they didn't go over them. And in fact, he changed it to where they're just, they're afraid of them. Right? He said, he put, a, instilled a fear in these people so that they would not attack. And it's just one more evidence of the power of God. When we're doing what, when we're going to do what's right, when, and especially when God makes a promise to you, we could rest assured that it is true and that it will come to pass. And we have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about. All throughout the Bible, he's telling us not to fear man. Don't fear. All we need to do is fear God. Fear God and that's enough. Don't fear what man can do unto you. Don't fear these other people. Now, we ought to do what's right, but not out of a fear of man, but out of a fear of God. See, when, when Jacob and his family are, you know, they have these false gods and all this other stuff going on, what they need to fear more than anything is not so much what other people are going to do to them, it's, it's the loss maybe of God's protection. It's fearing God and making God angry with you because if God wants something to happen to you, guess what? It's going to happen no matter what. If a man comes to fight against you, hey, you've got a fighting chance against a man. I mean, you could, you know, who knows what will happen, right? But when you're fighting against God, do <laughs> you really think you have any chance of winning? Absolutely not. So we need to have that proper fear of God. And, and it's, it's twofold. One, we don't want to be fighting against Him. But two, if we have Him on our side, who can fight against God? So if they try to fight against us, what, what do we have to worry about? If we're doing what's right because we fear God, hey, God will protect us. And God protected Jacob. And He promised to protect him. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 6. But unto the sons, no, excuse me, there we go, I was in 25, not 35. Verse number 6, so Jacob came to Luz, which is the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. So he makes it back to Bethel and he puts up this altar again. You remember before, he had built a pillar when he was there the first time before he had gotten into the land of Paid and Aram. And um, that's when he saw the angel of God ascending and descending. And um, verse number eight says, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Alan Bakuth. Now, this is kind of interesting, and, and this has me puzzled a little bit um, why this is even in here. We don't see much about Rebecca's nurse anywhere in the Bible, yet in here it's saying that Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. So obviously, he's she is traveling with Jacob. We know that she didn't go with Jacob out of the land, into the land of Paid and Aram when he was going to find a wife. There's definitely no evidence of that. It was, he was by himself when he left. He left alone to go into that land. Now, that's also where Rebecca came. That was Rebecca's brother, it was Laban, right? So, the only thing I could gather is that Rebecca's nurse, or at least one of her nurses, stayed back in Paid and Aram, 
and was with Laban, and then she decided to leave also with Jacob when he left um, Laban and, and all of his family, that she decided to come along with him, and she ends up dying in the way here. But um, very interesting. I, I haven't been able to figure out exactly any more meaning to what this verse is here for, but if something you're interested in studied out and you figured out, let me know. I'd, I'd love to know more about why this particular verse, because I don't believe anything is in here by accident in the Bible. Everything's there for a reason. But this, is, uh, this one puzzles me a little bit. Let's keep reading. Verse number 9. And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Paden Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So here we see God reaffirming and repeating unto him, look, you know, like, you're Israel. You're not Jacob. And, and I think God needs to get that through in his head because Jacob continued being Jacob. That he started getting on the right path. He, he kind of screwed up with, with backsliding and being in Shechem. He says, no, you need to... Because remember, what Israel meant is that he was going to be a prince. And a prince is someone who's, who's in authority. He's a ruler. And in order to rule well, you know, God's reminding him, look, you're Israel. You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. You need to lead your family. Why is it so important for, for Jacob for Israel to lead his family. He says, your, your ancestors are going to be kings. You are in the process of, of building nations and kings that are going to come out of you in order for these people to be successful, in order for your family to grow and to do this. He says, you need to lead. You need to be the prince. You need to be Israel. You need to step it up. You need to, to walk closer to me. You need to do the things that I want you to do and you need to lead your family well. It was apparent he wasn't leading his family well. And God calls him back and he's like, get back here, come to Bethel, build an altar here, I need to talk to you. And God straightens him out. Now, one thing that, that you'll notice as you read the Bible and especially in these stories in Genesis, God's very repetitive. And as people, I think we need that. God repeats his promises multiple times. How many times did God tell Abraham and tell Isaac and now tell Jacob about their inheritance, about their promises, about them inheriting the land, about all this stuff that he's going to do? I'm going to multiply your seed. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to multiply. You're going to increase. There's going to be kings. There's going to be nations that come out of you. And he's, and he's telling these people over and over again. God's reminding them. Now, God should only have to tell us once, but he doesn't. But the repetition is important. We need that. We need the, the reassurance. And, and to get that from time to time, you know, when you do start to feel like you're backsliding, when you do start to doubt things, and, and you do start to have fears come up, because they all had these different fears and these different problems arise, you know, whether it be Esau or whether it be, you know, the people of the land and all this fear of danger and every, all fear on all sides. Yet God's promise is sure. God's promise is true. God had already promised that this land was going to go to Jacob and to his seed and everything else. Even though, you know, there was, they did the bad things. You know, his sons did, did bad things. His daughter did a bad thing. You know, God's promise cannot fail. And we could have uh, uh, rest assured in God's promises. Now, God was, was literally speaking to these people back then. God doesn't speak to us. He's not going to keep repeating himself to you and tell you what to do except through his word. The repetition is important for us to stay on the right path, to stay doing what's right, which is why I believe it's important for you to stay in God's word. You say, well, I've already read the Bible cover to cover. Read it again. You need the repetition. I already read the Bible yesterday. Read it again today. I'm already reading. Look, you, we need this. We need to get it through our heads. We need to stay in good communication with God. We need to stay on the right path. The repetition is important. Let's keep reading here. In, uh... Oh, 
flip back if you would, because I want to point this out too. God actually, this is a fulfillment of the promise that was made in Genesis 28. Because 28, Genesis 28 is where God appeared to him in Bethel the first time. And in verse 15 of Genesis 28, the Bible reads, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this, into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So he's saying, I am going to be with you. I'm going to be with you when you're over there. He says, I'm going to be with you the whole time until you get back into this land. Until you get back here. He says, I'm not going to leave you until then. You may leave him after that, but he says, you know, you're, I'm with you this whole way, all the way up until all this is fulfilled. When he gets all the way back to Bethel, God shows that he was absolutely true to his promise. He kept him from all evil. He kept him from all harm. In the face of lots of harm, he brought him back and he kept him there. And um, what I think is also interesting is in that same chapter in 28, in verse 21, you know, God, because God had appeared unto Jacob and then he, in a dream, in a vision, and he tells him all this stuff, how he's going to be with him. And then Jacob's like, wow, I, you know, God spoke to me and he builds this pillar and then he makes a vow in verse 20. He says, and Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this is when Jacob makes that vow, right? Saying, okay. Well, if God will do all of these things that he's promised unto me, if, if he does do all this stuff, then he will be my God. That was his attitude at the very beginning, right? Of thinking that, well, if God basically proves himself to be God and comes through on all these promises, then, then I'll trust him to be God. But here we are now in chapter 35, and God has proven himself without a doubt. But do you think this is the moment now where Jacob's like, okay, God, you're my God? No. It's been evidenced way before that that Jacob has been relying on God. He's grown past that point, past that point of initially, you know, hearing God's word and then, and then believing on him. He's grown quite a bit since then. He's, he's already seen God's action come to pass and he doesn't need any more convincing. This is just the, the, the absolute... Um, coming to pass of God's promise. But I think that Jacob has already, because he was already building altars. He built an altar outside of, um, or a pillar outside of Shechem when he got there. God, you know, the Lord has been Jacob's God through this whole time. We see that, that promise that he makes, but that's not, you know, he didn't, he didn't end up wait, having to wait all the way until he got back in order to understand who the true Lord is and who the true God is. But let's go, go back to Genesis 35, um, where we were reading, let's see, verse number 13. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So we see here, you know, of course, Rachel only had Joseph, on her own. But if you remember when she did have Joseph, she named him Joseph and then she said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And he did. She was right. He did add to another son. Unfortunately, the son came and, and it also ended up, you know, her life left because of the hard labor. It ended up costing her life having this second son. But, um, and his name was called Benjamin. Now I'm going to point this out here real briefly because 
in the next couple weeks, not next week, but the week after, we're going to start going more into the life of Joseph. And we're going to see that Joseph didn't even know that Benjamin was born. So what we're doing right now in, in covering this, this chapter 35, it's covering a, a significant time frame to where all the events that we're going to be reading about Joseph had already started taking place. He had already, you know, at this point when Benjamin's being born, Jacob thinks that Joseph is dead. And, and some of those events we're going to read later have already happened. So the chronology is going to be a little bit, but, but it makes sense. The Bible does this many times where it's going to give you kind of an overview or a broader spectrum of what happens. And then in later chapters, it's going to go backwards a little bit and give you a lot more details. Because it, I mean, it only makes sense to get the full picture and then say, okay, well, here's some more of the details. In Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is a great example of that. Right? Genesis chapter 1 explains all the, the, si the six days of creation. Right? And then the seventh day is a day of rest. But then in chapter 2, it goes back and describes further the events that happened earlier on, like in, in chap in, um, when God created man and the beasts. Right? So people will say, oh yeah, see, this isn't even out of order. When did he do it? Like He's creating even more stuff. I look, no, it goes backwards to give you more details because the first chapter gives you the information that, that needs to be there as a foundation, and then he goes back further. So we're doing the same thing here. Genesis 35, um, we're getting a much grand because this takes a lot of time to do all this moving. I didn't, again, and I don't know the mileage between the, the northernmost part of Israel going all the way down south, but remember, he's traveling with herds and with people and, you know, and with all these things, and they're not like jumping on a train. You know, they're walking, basically. They're, they're, they're making this trek and they have to survive and they have to keep moving. So this is taking a significant amount of time. And let's keep reading here. It says, um, And his father called his name Benjamin, verse 19, And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. This is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. And it came to pass... When Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now, the sons of Jacob were twelve, and he's going to list off the twelve sons. Now, we're going to get into this later when, um, when Israel ends up blessing his children. This comes back into play, what Reuben did with his concubine. Basically, what Reuben did is he, he lays down with... Reuben's mother was Leah. Rachel only had two sons. She had Joseph and Benjamin. Rachel's handmaid is this Bilhah. And that's who Reuben ends up you know, committing this sin with. It was his father's concubine. He ends up laying with her. Because remember, his father had children by Bilhah. But Reuben goes and he lays with her. And that is a that is a very grievous sin. It's a, a very bad thing they did now. He, and he pays for that and basically gets his birthright stripped away as a result of that. But we're, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on that when we go into the chapter that covers the, um, all the blessings in the future when we get to that chapter. But uh, let's keep reading here. It says in verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. The firstborn received a, a double portion of the inheritance um, normally. But, um, of course, he, he screws that up when he goes in unto, unto Bilhah, and his father finds out about it. So it says, and Israel heard it. He found out that, that he did that. Um, the sons of Leah, verse 23, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. And the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad, and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him and paid in Aram. And it's also going to be interesting in the future, too. We'll cover this a little bit more. But the sons of the handmaid seem to be a lot more troublemakers than the other sons. And this goes all the way back to, you know, the problems with having polygamous marriages. Because they're not all loved equally. We know who Jacob loved the most. He loved Rachel the most, and then he loved Leah, and then he loved, I mean, he probably didn't even love the concubines. He was just doing that to appease his wives, 
or whatever reason he decided to do that foolish act. But um, we're going to see later. Again, these are, these are the, the ones that are the biggest instigators against Joseph, too. Um, but we'll get into that later as well. But it's important to know that. I mean, the Bible doesn't list this off for no reason. It tells you who was born of who, and, that, and, and it specifically lays out here uh, the children that were born unto each of the women because it's going to be coming important in the next couple chapters. Verse uh, 27, And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were an hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Now, I don't know exactly how old Isaac was when Jacob left. I was looking at the years trying to figure it out, but we know this much. We know that Isaac, or yeah, we know that Isaac was 60 years old. He was 40 when he got married. 20 years later, Jacob and Esau were born. He was 60 years old. And we know that Esau was 40 years old when he took a wife. So that was 100 years. Basically, when Isaac was 100 years old, Esau was marrying these women that, that were of the heathen, right, of the Canaanites. And, that, and after that is when Jacob was sent away, right? And remember when the, the blessing came before before Jacob even left because Isaac was already old and his eyes were getting dim and he didn't know when he was going to, he thought he was going to die soon. But that's kind of funny in itself that, you know, here he is, he's probably, you know, 100 years old at least, 100 plus, thinking, you know, I'm old. And he was, he was an old man. He's like, I'm going to die at any time. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to make sure I get these blessings taken care of. He lived for another 80 years. Or so roughly, you know, I mean, he lived for a long, a long time after that, you know, and people these days, I know a lot of people think, you know, oh, I'm not going to live that to be that old. I don't know how long I've lived and everything else. You don't know what God has in store for you. Maybe your life will be gone tomorrow, but you know what? Maybe you've got a long time to go yet. We need to live because we don't know. We need to live as if, as if who knows how long we're going to live. And continue to work for the Lord as long as we're here and never give up on that and, and never just quit and just be done and be like, well, I'm getting pretty old now and I'm just going to die soon anyway, so who cares? Isaac lived until 180 years old. I'm not saying you're going to live to 180 years old, but all I'm saying is that we don't know because a lot of people these days, especially young people have this, have this mindset sometimes of, oh, I'm not going to live to be that old for whatever reason and just kind of have this, this down attitude of, of not, not thinking you're going to survive very long. But we ought not to think that way. You know, God can extend your life. God could do anything. And we, what we need to do is maximize the time that we have here and, um, and make sure that we're doing the most to live for God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for these stories in the Bible. I pray that you would please just continue to instruct us and teach us, God, especially when we find some of these verses, you know, the, the big ones, the important ones, the important lessons to learn um, need to stick with us. But God, also I pray that you would just help us open up our understanding on these other things that we find that we may not understand exactly why it's, it's put in the Bible. We pray that you would please just continue to work with us and, and help us to learn and understand more as we study your word that... Um, the seemingly unimportant verses in the Bible, we pray that you would please help us to further understand them and, and to gain more knowledge through them, dear Lord. We thank you for all the stories that you've given us in the Bible to help us to, to learn, um, in many cases, from other people's mistakes and from the unwavering truth and promises that you give that they always come to pass, dear God. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.